Have you ever had a patient aspirate during a swallow study and felt your heart skip a beat? We've all been there. And yes, it can be a scary situation, but today I'm here to tell you that aspiration might not always be as dangerous as we think. We're going to cover three main topics today. Number one, what happens to the lungs after aspiration and why the consistency of the aspirated material matters. Number two, what kind of pulmonary defenses do we have that might protect us against aspiration? And three, how this knowledge can help your patient. Hi, I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist since 2008. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders, and I'm the founder and CEO of the MetaCLP Collective and MetaCLP Education. Author of the best selling book, So You're Having Trouble Swallowing, and host of the Swallow Your Pride podcast, which has over 5 million downloads. Welcome, I am so glad you are here. Number one, what happens to the lungs after aspiration and why the consistency of the aspirated material matters? First things first, let's talk about anatomy. Our lungs are like an upside down tree with tiny branches called bronchioles. These bronchioles are incredibly small, way smaller than you probably imagine. Think about it this way. The trachea is only about the width of your pinky knuckle, and it splits in half 23 times to get all the way down to those tiny, minuscule bronchioles. And what happens with really small tubes? Stuff gets stuck in them. Have you ever had bubble tea? You catch my drift. Come down the rabbit hole with me for a second. When someone aspirates, where does that liquid or food actually go? Depends on the consistency. More solid consistencies or very thick substances are more likely to get stuck in the inner airways, which can lead to choking. But liquids, especially thin liquids, are unlikely to obstruct the larger airways, and so instead will travel to the gravity-dependent areas of the lungs and down into those tiny bronchioles. But thin liquids, especially water, tend not to cause a whole lot of problems in the lungs. Imagine a single drop of dye falling into a swimming pool. It disperses quickly and becomes diluted, losing its intensity. It spreads out and thins out to the point that it's almost invisible. It's the same with small amounts of aspirated liquid in the lungs. They tend to disperse throughout the lungs and our bodies are surprisingly good at clearing them out after they've dispersed. Now, aspiration isn't always obvious. Sometimes people aspirate without even coughing. This is called silent aspiration, and it can be impossible to detect during a bedside swallow evaluation. That's why we rely on instrumental swallowing evaluations like flexible endoscopic evaluation of swallowing and modified barium swallow studies to get a clear picture of what's happening during swallowing. I remember hearing about a patient who had mild dysphagia. She would aspirate small amounts of thin liquid with almost every sip, but she never coughed or showed any signs of distress. After extensive education on risks and benefits, she declined thickened liquids and opted to continue thin liquids. We monitored her very closely with frequent follow-ups and multiple chest x-rays over the next few weeks, but she never developed any respiratory complications. So here's the thing. The type of substance aspirated really matters. Think of it this way. Water versus orange juice. Water is pretty harmless, but orange juice is acidic and sticky. If you spill it on the floor, it's harder to clean up, right? The same goes for our lungs. Thicker, more acidic substances like coffee, juice, soda, or thickened liquids can irritate the lungs and increase the risk of complications like aspiration pneumonitis, pneumonia, and respiratory distress. Along the same lines, if a patient has a significant buildup of residue in the throat and starts aspirating solid consistencies, that is going to be a lot more concerning than small amounts of liquid. Why? Well, they can be harder for the lungs to clear out. Number two. What kind of pulmonary defenses do we have that might protect us against aspiration? Now, it's important not to get too freaked out by aspiration in a person with otherwise healthy lungs. Why? Our lungs have amazing defense mechanisms that protect themselves against foreign invaders. They aren't two little defenseless sitting ducks just waiting for an infection to come in and tear them apart. Our pulmonary system has tiny hairs called cilia. These cilia are covered in mucus and line our airways to help trap and clear out foreign substances through a process called mucociliary clearance. We also, of course, have a cough reflex to expel anything that shouldn't be there. And believe it or not, our lungs can even absorb small amounts of liquids directly into the bloodstream through something called aquaporins, a transmembrane protein that we've had revved up and ready to go since we were itty bitty babies in our mother's womb. But it doesn't stop there. Our immune system also plays a crucial role. 
We have these amazing white blood cells that patrol our lungs and gobble up any bacteria or foreign particles that might cause an infection. It's like a microscopic Mr. Clean ready to come and suck up the bad guys. I once had a patient that was understandably worried about his recent swallow study results, which showed aspiration of thin liquids. He enjoyed his tea and coffee and was concerned about giving them up. But more importantly, he was frightened by the prospect of aspiration pneumonia. However, other than the occasional aspiration, he was in pretty good shape with a healthy respiratory and immune system. To ease his fears about aspiration, the SLP explained that while aspiration needs careful management, his body was well equipped to handle small amounts of liquid. The SLP described how the cilia, tiny hairs in his airways, acted like a miniature cleaning crew, constantly sweeping up and removing foreign material. His own cough reflex was another powerful defense, expelling anything that shouldn't be in his lungs. Surprisingly, his lungs could even absorb small amounts of liquid, like a sponge, thanks to these special proteins called aquaporins. Further, his immune system was always on patrol, with white blood cells acting like Pac-Man to gobble up any harmful bacteria. Reassured by the knowledge that his body had natural defenses, this patient felt empowered and ready to collaborate on strategies to minimize his aspiration risk while still enjoying his favorite beverages. Don't miss out on more videos like this. Hit that like button, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you never miss an update. Got questions about aspiration? Drop a comment below. Stick around to the end for a special freebie. Number three, how this knowledge can help your patient. Of course, these defenses aren't foolproof. Certain factors can increase the risk of developing aspiration pneumonia, such as the volume of aspiration and the patient's host factors, such as their age, underlying medical conditions, poor oral hygiene, and decreased mobility. That's why it's so important to take a holistic approach to manage aspiration risk. We need to consider all of these factors and work closely with our patients to develop an individualized plan. Communication is key. We need to clearly explain these nuances to our patients, show them their swallow study results, discuss the risks and benefits of different consistencies, and involve them in the decision-making process. I had another patient with a history of recurrent pneumonia. I worked hard with her to improve her oral hygiene and practice swallowing exercises to improve her ability to protect her airway. We discussed strategies to minimize aspiration risk, such as taking smaller bites and sips and avoiding thick, sticky consistencies that were more likely to result in aspiration during her instrumental swallowing evaluation. This wasn't a magic bullet, of course, but it did seem to improve her respiratory status and reduce the frequency of her hospitalizations. Remember, our goal is to empower our patients to make informed choices. By understanding the nuances of aspiration, we can provide the best possible care and help our patients live their lives to the fullest. Now, I know you might be wondering, what if my patient aspirates despite our best efforts? How can I tell if aspiration is causing the problem? What are the signs of aspiration pneumonia? These are all great questions. First, it's important to remember that aspiration is sometimes completely unavoidable, but by closely monitoring our patients and addressing any potential complications as soon as they arise, we can minimize the risks. Look for signs of increased coughing during meals or any other signs or symptoms of dysphagia. Aspiration pneumonia can be tricky to diagnose, but some common signs include a cough, shortness of breath, chest pains, signs of infection, and abnormal chest imaging. If you suspect your patient has aspiration pneumonia, it's crucial to discuss these concerns with the attending physician right away to evaluate and obtain the right treatment before it gets worse. Managing aspiration can be challenging, but it's also incredibly rewarding. By staying informed, collaborating with our patients, and utilizing evidence-based practices, we can make a huge difference in their lives. Want to boost your SLP skills and connect with a supportive community? Head over to MedSLPCollective.com for a free gift. You'll get a downloadable MedSLP Collective clipboard kit, plus access to a free resource on aspiration pneumonia. This ready to use handout helps your patients with dysphagia understand aspiration pneumonia. Join our vibrant community of SLPs and mentors for support and guidance on your toughest cases. Grab your freebie below now, the link is in the description.